Well, let me start again. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Welcome. Uh, I hope you had a really good weekend and everything was uh, was uh, fine and dandy for you. And, and uh, I, I heard there was some news, but uh, I didn't pay attention. Uh, English Language Proficiency Assessments for California, also known as the LPAC. This re um, replaces the CELT, which was not such a good assessment, but this this is the new one that they're that we're using. There is a website for it, and if you're curious what that website looks like, it looks just like this. And uh, you can visit this if you would like and get to know it better. But I will tell you that you will get a lot more information in the credential program about this. My job is just to give you a surface understanding of what this is, what it does, and uh, that is what I'm going to uh, do. So. I just have to admit some people to um, our class, which I have done, and in they go. And so what I was telling you is that what makes teaching really effective is uh, first making sure that you're screen sharing when you're supposed to be and recording uh, when you're supposed to be, like, like having a checklist, you know, on another screen because, wow, I've got three screens I'm looking at. I even could have a fourth one, but there's not room. So having a checklist would, uh, would be great. I'm saying this because I think I probably need a checklist, just like pilots before they fly. You know, they go through these steps and everything else. The other thing that helps is telling a story, having some kind of compelling story that you want to convey to students so that it really draws them in, and, uh, and also building on prior knowledge, yes. Having students go through an experience and then build on that knowledge is really, really useful so that there is some accumulation of knowledge, which is what we're going to do tonight. So you're familiar with the solemn rubric and you know all of the dimensions of it from comprehension to fluency, to vocabulary, to pronunciation, to grammar. You even tried to apply this to a couple of students to figure out what their solemn level was. And we did that and we don't need to uh, uh, really do that, uh, that again, but that provides you with a foundation for understanding other rubrics and the LPAC provides another rubric. So you have some background knowledge now. Isn't this great? It's great, watch the next thing. You even experienced this, a different rubric, which had the silent period or early production or, and excuse me, the speech emergence stage or the intermediate language proficiency stage and finally advanced fluency. And all of these areas simply line up really with what the solemn had to say. It's the same type of thing. From the silent period to advanced fluency, you can see that this is likely the silent period here all the way to advanced fluency. Are there different criteria? Probably. Do they overlap with this? Probably somewhat. But the point is that once you get the hang of how these rubrics for English learners are structured, you can figure out any rubric that they throw at you. And you're going to be uh, experiencing a lot of rubrics. So let me move you now to the LPAC. And these are the uh, California specific assessments of English learners. Uh, they're new, but they have been in use now for, uh, for a few years, actually. And so you'll want to pay attention to what they consider level one, two, three, and four. The language that they use for somebody who's considered maybe in the silent period or only in the one or two word stage of, we, of, of what we've experienced is called emerging. So this is the language that you're actually going to use when you are working with English learners. Some of your students will be said to be emerging. Now there's another level, expanding, and that covers level two to three, just like you see here. There is sort of an overlap between level two and three, and now you have some idea, hopefully, of what a level two looks like and what a level three looks like. If you don't, go back to the videos, watch them again, and you'll be able to see what is, uh, what's going on. So from emerging, it's expanding language, emerging language, expanding language. And, and then we go to bridging. Bridging is like a high level three or a entry level four to the end. Bridging to what? Bridging to become a lifelong learner of English. And, 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 and that is the, what, the, um, what the, 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 the categories are. You'll see this when we look at the whole thing, but all I want to tell you is that you have enough background knowledge now to understand what this thing is and what it's trying to accomplish. And that's a lot. It really is. And, and I think that um, 
uh, that you should, uh, you know, be uh, happy uh, with that knowledge because you're going to use it again. This stuff will show up in the credential program and in real life. So let me continue with what, <clears throat> what I'm explaining. I want to describe the emerging, expanding, and bridging stages to you so that you have an understanding of what they are. And then I want us to do an assessment together so that you can get an idea of what students are going to have to do when they are, are, are going to be assessed in, uh, in uh, LPAC land. And the assessment that I'm going to use is the same kind of assessment that we've seen already, speaking. So there is an assessment of speaking that we're going to see. But before I get to that, let's uh, take a look at the elements of, uh, of the LPAC. Okay, so this is what they describe as, as emerging. And all I want you to do is to be thinking about this right now and thinking about the students that we've seen. And you've seen at least two students who are, were emerging or, or, uh, or in the silent period. Two of them, remember. Uh, students at this level typically progress very quickly learning to use English for immediate needs, as well as beginning to understand and use academic vocabulary and features of academic vocabulary. Now, please understand something. In LPAC land, there is a division, there's a separation between what they call English language development, which is just the spoken language that you use to get what you need wherever you're going, all of that stuff that I described to you a while ago uh, when we talked about communicative competence. Do you remember that? If not, go back to the video because I believe that I, I believe I recorded it. But go back and watch communicative competence, being able to survive in the classroom, the playground, in the content areas, but it's language to accomplish uh, needs like a pencil, give me a pencil. It's like, hello, goodbye. It's like, how are you doing? It's all of the language that surrounds what we call academic language. An academic language is the language of the content areas. That is symbols and metaphors in, uh, in, um, in um, uh, literature, for example, or uh, in, uh, in, 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 in math, it's the Pythagorean theorem, uh, you know, or in biology, the Krebs cycle. And I usually ask students, are you for or against the Krebs cycle? And everybody goes, ha, ha, ha. And then we go to expanding. Expanding, what is that? Students at this level are challenged to increase their English language skills in more context and learn of greater variety of vocabulary and linguistic structures, applying their growing language skills in more sophisticated ways that are appropriate to their age and their grade level. Now, let me tell you this, my friends. This says that students are at this level and students should be able to do what they're saying is what the teacher needs to cultivate. So when you read these standards, sometimes Teachers will read these, well, novice teachers will read them in, in an incorrect way because it's like what the student is supposed to be able to do, okay? It's actually what the teacher is supposed to cultivate in the student so the student can do what you are seeing here. They're not going to do it just by themselves. And remember, there are two things that we're trying to cultivate. English language development for accomplishing in, uh, uh, tasks in the language for specific pencils, uh, <laughs> pencils for specific purposes to satisfy needs, wants, desires, uh, etc. That's the language that's around things like language in the classroom, language at the bank, language at home, or academic language. Now let's go to bridging. Students at this level continue to learn and apply a range of high-level English skills in a, in a wide variety of contexts, including comprehension and production of highly technical text. Now, let me pause here. It's always good to look at what the highest level demands and then look backward. When you are planning your lessons, when you plan your lessons and you have a range of students in your classroom and you have a range of abilities in your classroom, you need to be thinking about how am I going to get everybody up to bridging? Think about experiences. Think about scaffolds. Think about things that you are going to do in order to bring, uh, bring the students up in order to be able to, to understand uh, and, and be able to perform this. The bridge alluded to is the transition to full engagement in grade level academic texts. So that's like reclassification to fluent English proficient, or as they say in these standards, a lifelong language learner. Let me 
go back. The bridge alluded to is the transition to full engagement in grade level academic tasks. Uh, pardon me, and activities in a variety of content areas without the need for specialized ELD instruction. However, ELs at all levels of English language proficiency fully participate in grade level tasks in all content areas with varying degrees of scaffolding in order to help to develop both content knowledge and English. So this is where I have been trying to bring everyone. And, 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 and I'm getting uh, better at putting this thing together and, and eventually it's going to be great. Right now I know it's only fair, uh, but I, nonetheless, you have the background knowledge necessary to understand this. And when you see things like this, the students, regardless of their level, emerging, expanding, or bridging, they're going to participate in grade level tasks in all of the content areas. Now, maybe your emerging students will be given a different kind of instruction. I'm going to go over bilingual models next week, but, but in this case, uh, I don't think that you'll have too many emerging students uh, in your class, but if you did, note that using the first language if the student has the ability to speak and read and understand it is perfect. And thinking of those two girls who are interacting together, that is what's going to get a student from an emerging to an expanding to bridging. Now, developing their content area first might be done in small groups, in their first language, but then they will move from that into the kinds of active learning that we saw in third grade, in that third grade math. And I'll tell you why. Those girls that you saw interacting uh, know how to write and speak and do things on this assessment that's going to get them to bridging. Moreover, that video also shows the kind of instruction and the kind of interaction that students are gonna to need to do in order to survive the new California standards that we're all, all familiar with and the assessment of those standards. We'll talk about the assessment of those standards separately. This, however, is a different level type of instruction and the, uh, the LPAC has an assessment that goes along with it. So let me continue. When we're looking at emerging, expanding, and bridging, they talk about and use a lot of jargon uh, that uh, I'm not going to, uh, to worry about uh, too much, uh, but they, uh, they have PLDs, which are performance level descriptors is what, that, is what that means. Each performance level descriptor includes the following. So when we start to look at the actual standards for emerging, expanding, and bridging students, kindergarten to K-12, this is what they're looking for in proficiency. This is a general descriptor of an EL's ability at entry to progress through and exit from a level. So every one of these levels from emerging has an entry and an exit. Expanding has an entry and an exit. And bridging has an entry and an exit back that will lead to that lifelong thing that I was type talking about. And I'll just type in life uh, like this. So early stages will describe the abilities of English learners have at the early stages of development, either here or here or here. This is what they, this is what they mean. Descriptors of abilities that English language students have at exit level from the level. That means, and I'll use a square, here and here and here. So follow along, everybody. When you think about those English learners that I showed you, and I had you watch a number of them, and I had you write up two of them, you need to think about them in these terms. Some are emerging. That was the student who said nothing. Remember him, the little fellow who is standing there and his friend is doing all the talking for him? That's an example of somebody who's right here at the beginning stages of language development. That boy that we saw who was talking to the other student, uh, I forgot, unfortunately, I forgot his name, but he was, uh, uh, they, were, they were outside and they were both talking and they were the first video that we saw. That student I would put here at late emerging. 
That's where I would put him. Now, I don't want to go over all these things because you'll be bored and depressed, but the point is that when you look at these standards right here, and I think that you should watch this video and I should even let you download it, because when you go to the credential program and when you go out and you do real student teaching and when you become a real teacher, now you know better than a lot of people of what this is referring to. A lot of people have the slightest idea. They don't know how to read these things. But you're going to. Don't you feel good? I hope so. Well, let me move on. The descriptions for early uh, and exit stages of proficiency level are detailed across three modes of communication. Now, please follow along. All of the standards we're going to look at are built around collaboration, interpretive, comprehension, and production. When I showed you that video of those girls interacting, it wasn't just for fun. It was because the kind of interactions and scaffolds that those students used are the ones that you need to be aware of so that you can cultivate collaboration, help them with interpretation of what? Of text, of language, of math, of science, whatever it is, and being able to produce language, oral presentation and written text to show that they have understanding. There are two additional dimensions. One is metalinguistic awareness. Let me tell you what that is. We're going to see this again, but metalinguistic awareness is being able to think through a problem. I showed you, I think, I know maybe I haven't, I have not showed you a think aloud, but I put one on the slide. I hope that you took the time to go and watch the videos that go along with it. If you didn't, number one, shame on you. Number two, go back and do it. Because the think aloud is one where a teacher is showing the students how to think through a problem. They, for example, are going to be saying, who is the main character to themselves? What are they doing? Where are they going? Why is that character crying? It's a process of self-questioning that students will do in order to understand what they're reading or what they're looking at. And how does one learn that? By modeling, through teacher modeling. That's how it works. Accuracy of production. This is, just think of the solemn right here, everybody. The accuracy of production in terms of fluency, whether the language is comprehensible, whether or not the, uh, uh, the, the students have a good pronunciation, etc. So this right here is a lot like the solemn. So just look at this for a moment, and I know it's a lot of words on the screen and you're ready to scream, but you've understood quite a bit. You've understood a lot. You've understood more than what people who simply pick this thing up and try to make sense of it do, because you have background knowledge, you have some experience now, and you can understand how this fits together. Now, the next thing is to see it. I should pause and take questions, which is what I'm gonna do, and let me show you a trick. I'm going to mute myself and count to 10. You're supposed to be thinking of a question if you got one, because I'm on five now. OK, it looks like there aren't any questions. Is that the case? No questions, my friends? Nothing? Nothing at all? OK. Looking around, let me look at uh, my screen. Let me look at the gallery. Uh, all of you look uh, mostly awake. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Unless you have a picture up, then I don't know what you're doing, but that's fine. Moving on. All right. This has way too much language on it. This is, this, is, this is something that nobody should ever do. Don't ever put this much language on a slide because nobody's going to be able to read it. All I want you to do is just follow along as I try to make this somewhat somewhat interesting. All right, let's, let's start here. This is how these standards are constructed. On one side are student capacities. On another side, emerging, expanding, bridging, and then finally, lifelong language learning. That's, that's what this is. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to go through the top ones that you see here. And, and here's what I want to tell you. Again, you have enough knowledge now to understand what this is telling you, because you've seen it and you've written about it. 
They start with student capacities. They look at the native language. They take the native language into consideration. Why do they take the native language into consideration? Normally, you know, I'd be throwing these questions out, but uh, it's just not, uh, not going to work. So I'm, I'm just going to, uh, going to tell you uh, that if the student has the ability to read, write, and speak in their native language, please bring in texts that they can understand if they want them. Some students may not, but please use the native language as a bridge because that's how you will develop academic content. I'm going to explain how that works when we talk about uh, Bix and Kelp, another theory that, uh, that's important. Uh, but I'm not talking about Bix and Kelp right now. What I'm talking about is please bring in the native language if the student can understand it. Now, look at what entry to emerging is. English learners enter the emerging level having limited receptive and productive skills. In English, you've seen this. With two students, you saw one in the silent period, and then you saw a young person who's probably close to exiting the emerging stage. Upon exit from the emerging level, students have basic communication skills in social and academic contexts. My friends, you have some background in this now. I'm not kidding you. You actually have some background in this. Just from watching the videos, I know it's not the same as... Uh, as being live, but someday you will be live and you're going to see this for yourselves. Expanding, as English learners progress through the expanding level, they move from being able to refashion learn phrases and sentences in English to meet their immediate communication and learning needs. But that means that they have some, some ability to use the language creatively rather than just saying, I need a pencil, please hand me a pencil. They're starting to be able to say, like, give me a pencil or hand me that, would you? Listen to English. Isn't English great? We make it so complicated. Would you? And give me. I got a question that came up in the chat. I will look at it in a moment. Upon exit from this expanding level, students can use English to communicate about a range of topics and academic content areas. So just think about this. You have seen this in the students that we looked at. So you have some background now in what this looks like. Now, I got a question that's a really good one. So if you don't speak the student's native language, should you implement the material that uses their native language only, or should you try to mix it like use half uh, English and half uh, native language? So here's what I would say. What I've been trying to uh, put forth, and, uh, and that's a great question, is just to remind everybody that the way you're going to get to a bridging level with students is to use centers and to use grouping and to use a lot of supports and tools so that maybe part of the time the L1 for maybe 15 minutes is used to name the parts of the cell because that is what's going to communicate the understanding to the student the fastest. Now you can model it. Sure, you're going to model for the students. You're going to do all of those things, but you can have the students engage in 15 minutes in their native language, the parts of the cell. And maybe the students here are doing the same thing and it's all English EO, English only, English only, or this could even be in pairs. But then you, got, you have to move the students around and so that these students are going to move into an English-only group, but with support. So it's using the language strategically. That's really, really what it's about. And it's a different way to teach everybody. And that's why I had you watch those girls interact. And, uh, and some of you really did a fantastic job of your descriptions. Some of you uh, did uh, just a job to get it done, it looked like, or maybe you needed support with it, I, I don't know. But I, I awarded points to everybody. But, but look, it's not about points. It's not about getting a pat on the head. My friends, you are going to have real kids in front of you one day, and you want to be competent about what you're doing. Throw yourselves at this, please, because you're going to save some kid's life one of these days. Not kidding you. You think I'm kidding you? I'm not kidding you. You know, the, the, instead of having a student in the back of the room 
who's an English learner who is just sitting there or, or, or ducking work. If you have enough proficiency with these kinds of models and understandings, you'll be able to have that student integrate faster and, and be a part of the classroom and take, take part in it. You still see students, when you student teach and you do your observations, in some classes you're still going to see the English learners in the back, not even on the same page, not answering questions, and the teacher's fine with that because they're not a problem. You know, that's just fine. That's no good. Let's move on. Bridging. As English learners progress through the bridging level, they move from being able to communicate in ways that are appropriate to different task purposes and audiences. And we've seen that. You saw some students who are really pretty high level. The girl from, uh, I can't, I don't know what, uh, what country she's from, but the African girl who was speaking was clearly bridging. She was ready to move into this stage. Upon exit from bridging, students can communicate effectively with various audiences on a wide range of familiar and new topics. She could speak to adults as well as she could speak to peers and probably even to small children and probably in any co uh, content area that, uh, that came up. Let me move to this, where all of us are right now. Students who have reached proficiency in the English language as determined by state and local criteria because there's exit criteria now, continue to build increasing breadth and depth and complexity and comprehending and communicating in English in a wide variety of contexts. All right, well, great. You have enough background now that that should have made sense to you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these standards uh, because uh, there just isn't time. I wanna get us to, to the assessment. So this is just a background knowledge for entering and getting out, entering, getting out, entering and getting out, entering and getting out based on a test. Your students are tested all the way through these stages on their way to being reclassified. But let me show you what this looks like now. Remember what I told you. There are dimensions here. You've seen dimensions in solemn comprehension, fluency, pronunciation. Look at the dimensions of this rubric. There is collaborative is one level of the rubric. Interpretive is another one. So collaborative, collaborative. Can they use language collaboratively? Think of those girls who are interacting. You have to get students to be able to do that. All of the students, every single one of them, native speaker of English, English learner, bilingual, trilingual, you have to have students interacting or they're not going to do this. And if they don't do it, my friends, the schools get punished for it because they have ELD on the radar. And if students aren't making their way through this, then schools get extra supervision. It's, it's, it's a helpful but punitive system at the same time. Interpretation, that means comprehension. Productive, that means speaking and writing. So let's just look at two of these things. Early and exit for emerging. Use basic social conversations to participate in conversations, conventions to participate in conversations, participate in simple face-to-face -face conversations with peers and others. Again, these standards are telling you what to do. These standards are telling you how to teach English learners. You have to find a way through scaffolds and experiences to try to get students to be able to move from emerging to this right here. There is no excuse for anybody to say anymore, I have an English learner and I don't know what to do with them. You have the examples right here. You have the examples for collaborative and interpretive. Let's take a look at what that is. Entry to emerging, comprehend frequently occurring words and basic phrases in immediate physical surroundings, comprehend a sequence of information on familiar topics. I'm not going to continue. You have seen this. You saw this with the solemn. You saw this with the examples I gave you. Production, this means speaking. You saw this with the solemn, everybody. Produce basic statements and ask questions and direct informational exchanges on familiar and routine subjects. I could continue to read to you, and I'm not going to do that. 
because I am going to ask that you read these things to become, become familiar with them. Everything that you have seen so far with the students that we've talked about are going to inform you of what this is indicating. I am telling you, you're going to be ahead of your peers and that's good. And I'm going to share this with the other instructors and I bet they have great stuff too. So I'm not like just telling you that. I think that I'm so fantastic. This has taken a lot of years. This has taken time from student questions. That's how I get good at this is from student questions who look at the stuff and they don't understand it. And then I try to figure it out and then I show it to them after building background knowledge and then students get it. Teachers learn just like students learn and you're gonna learn from your students too. The best education you're gonna get to become this lifelong language learner is actually going to come from your students. And that's why I'm telling you, you have to fall in love with this stuff. You can't do this for points or praise, or comparing yourself with other people, you're not gonna stay in this field if that's what, what you do. I'm telling you, I promise you that's the case. Why do teachers quit after five years? Because there aren't those kind of rewards in the field. The rewards are from seeing a student go from an early stage of bridging, initiate and sustain dialogue in a variety of grade level academic topics and social topics to participate fully in both academic and non-academic setting, settings requiring English. When you see students moving through these phrase, uh, uh, stages, and you know that it's because you deliberately planned experiences for them to be able to do this, there's no better reward for you. Just like for me, if you are looking at all of this stuff right now, and you can see in interpretation and in production, and you can see in your mind's eye the students that you looked at on those videos, then there's no greater reward for me because that means that you have a very good understanding of what this stuff is trying to tell you to do. Because again, it is not just what the students can do. This is about what you, the teacher, are going to help them do. I wanna move on. There is also metalinguistic awareness. So in the videos that I showed you on that, uh, that, that levels and, uh, and instruction, levels and types of instruction, it's there, a think aloud. For example, you saw an example from kindergarten, but think alouds are good even <clears throat> for you. How you're going to think through these standards and how you're going to then plan experiences for your students to develop these skills, it's essential. Metalinguistic awareness, again, is being able to think your way through a problem. In emerging, for example, I'm not going to read this to you, but it says, the English learner has an awareness of differences and similarities between their native language and English. I haven't talked about first or second language development yet, but I will, I'm getting to that. And I'm gonna talk about it within the framework of what you're understanding here. What this means is that the student can recognize cognates in a language. We'll talk about cognates later. For example, if I said to you right now, diciembre, you should all think if you're a monolingual English speaker, if you hear diciembre, you should think that's December. And, and you're right. Isn't that great? It's wonderful because there are words that share a similar background between English and Spanish and English and French and English in a variety of languages. It's true. Now, there are also things called false cognates, all right? Like the first time I tried to use the word embarazado, or embarazada, excuse me, in a, in a, in, in a sentence when I was in Colombia. What does it sound like? Embarazada sounds like embarrassed to me. So I told my mother-in-law in my emerging Spanish, Siento muy embarazado porque mi español es tan mal. Now, I thought I said, I feel very ashamed that, or embarrassed. I feel very embarrassed that my Spanish is so bad. Well, my mother-in-law laughed so hard that she called all of the other family members into the room so I could repeat it. Because what I said is that I feel very pregnant because my Spanish is so bad. Because embarazado, embarazado, 
It means pregnant. It doesn't mean embarrassed. There are false cognates in the language. So the students then understand that there are cognates and false cognates. They use metalinguistic awareness to do all kinds of repair work when they're speaking and in trying to understand texts that they're reading. And I'm not going to continue because you see down here, accuracy of production, that was part of the solemn. You have the background to be able to understand this. Now, I want to move on to look at grade three English language proficiency standards for the LPAC. And I want to just show you that I'm not going to read this overview to, to you. All I want to do really is show you a couple of things. Under collaboration, this is what the students should be able to do. Exchange information and ideas with others through oral collaboration, collaborative discussions on a range of social and academic to topics. I'm going to end at that one. When you look over here to the corresponding California uh, uh, content area standards for ELA, they reference them. This is for speaking and listening and listening. So you can reference this standard in ELD with this standard in ELA. So this is really important for uh, you who are in, um, in, uh, in going to teach elementary especially. But even, even, the, even if you're in high school science, that's what you're going to teach, these are the same standards that are going to be used for English language development. You as a science teacher are a language teacher. You might think, well, I teach content. I, I don't teach kids. I teach content. No, you teach children and you teach English learners, regardless of whether it's grade 12 or grade 9, science, chemistry, biology, whatever. My friends, you're a language teacher because this doesn't just fall on the English teachers anymore. Let me continue. So you saw this already, what this means when those two girls were engaging with one another. I know I keep saying the same thing over and over again, but look, it's easier to handle simple presentations that aren't so simple because what wasn't simple about that is how did teachers orchestrate the learning to get those kids to do this? because that's what you need to know, my friends. Let me continue. What does the interpretive dimension mean? It means that the students can listen actively to spoken English in a range of social and academic contexts. Now, let me pause for a moment. When you get a new English learner in your class, they're going to be assessed, that's true. But why don't you do your own assessment of students? and learn to do a checklist on every one of these things so you get a sense on your own of where these students are. And I'll tell you something else. Students who are native speakers of English also have to be able to do this stuff. I would not call myself as a member of the solid member of the minimum wage working class world. That's where I come from. I come from that group, and I'm not ashamed of it. I managed to, you know, progress in my language development and go on to do other things. But I'll tell you what, I could have used the ability to speak like those third grade kids because I didn't. I don't think I talked until I probably was in college, all right, because I was shocked and I, and I couldn't do it. And I used to sweat. And the first time I taught, it was a disaster, but I hung in there. And you should too. So what am I saying? Use this as a checklist for English learners, but gosh darn it, make sure everybody can do this. Moving on. For third grade, they lay out the ELD continuum. And I want to show you this again, because when you're looking at this and these standards, they're telling you what to do and how to teach these students. So again, I, 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 I will be so sad if you come to me someday and say, you know what, uh, Dr. Busalis or Chris, whatever you choose to call me, don't call me Mr. Busalis, that's my dad. And you come to me and say, I have a level one student and I don't know what to do with her because I'm going to cry. I will break down and cry. You'll see a grown man cry because look, it's right here in the standards, everybody. They tell you, for an emerging student, they should be able to contribute to conversations and express ideas by asking and answering yes, no, and WH questions. 
interacting via written English, collaborate with peers on joint writing projects of short informational and, and literary texts. I'm not going to go on. I need you to begin to think about the kinds, not worksheets, scaffolds that you're going to use to get students to do this. Think of, a, of an electronic document or things around the room that have questions on them for them to practice. You saw some of the instruction that I showed you. That word wall that that teacher had, where she had realia on the wall, and she had sentence frames and paragraph frames. And she had the students interacting and talking. You know, and a student at a level one might not speak for three months. But the student can be trying to participate. Because the way that those students are going to learn the language is by participating with other students using the language. If you're wondering why Dr. Busalis took one year of German and can only say wie geht's and gehst ins Kino, for those of you who are German speakers, I think I said what's up and I'm going to the movie theater, I think. That's, that was a lot of money for German and I didn't learn because we did not interact. If you don't engage, you're not going to learn it. Moving on. All of the stuff that you need to be doing and helping students learn is right here. Now, the question is, how are you going to do it? That's, I know. And I've got suggestions for you. The same thing for third grade interactions. Here are listening, reading, evaluating language, analyzing language. Let's look at this. Let's look at listening. Demonstrate active listening to read alouds and oral presentations by asking and answering basic questions with prompt and substantial support, or maybe even little whiteboards that they can hold up to show you what it is that they understood. Stay with me, everybody, please. Stay with me. I know it's a lot, but we're going to do something cool in a little bit. Well, at least I think it is. Uh, but in the example that you're going to see for the assessment, a student is going to listen to a passage and then what they have to do when they listen to that passage is this. They're going to have to speak and offer their opinions. Because part of the LPAC assessment is where students listen to a passage and then they have to respond to it by speaking. And somebody's going to grade and score their oral language development. Because the LPAC assesses reading, writing, listening, speaking, collaboration, and metacognition. Moving on. Presenting. That's what you're going to see assessed in here is the student's going to have to present. They have to listen, present, and support opinions. You're going to see that in a, in a moment. I want to move on because now we're really getting into too much minutia here, but you can look at these things and, and get a sense of, uh, of what they are and, uh, and what they mean. Now, as I said, my dear friends, I would like to show you an assessment, and I'm going to share this with you. It's, you can only read, do read only with it, unfortunately, uh, but that's okay. Uh, because I want us to look at a, an assessment. So let me get to the assessment part that I want to show you. And then we're going to take a break because you need one. Oh, for crying out loud, this thing is uh, going to drive me up a wall. Okay, here we go. Good. I'm finally there. Just give Dr. Busalis a moment, and, uh, and, and let me just have you look at this. What students have to do on this test is this. They're going to be in front of a computer, and the prompt is, Summarize the presentation by stating the main points and supporting details with the help of the visuals. They get visuals right here, and then they're going to actually listen to a passage. They're going to see this, and it looks like uh, it won't let me uh, zoom in, which is not any fun. Uh, but they get to look at the graphs. They get to look at all of this stuff. Now, think about this for an English learner. They have to process all of this information, and then they have to listen to a prompt, and then they have to write, summarize the presentation by stating main points and supporting details, or they have to speak. 
I'm going to have us take a, uh, let's see what time is it here? I don't know what time it is. It is 523. We'll come back at 530. And while we're taking our break, this is what I want you to think about. How are you going to get students, particularly English learners, to be able to do that? Because you're not going to get it in rows. You're not going to get it in worksheets. You're not going to get it by talking at, talking at them like I'm doing to you. You're going to get there through interaction. Take a break and figure out how you're going to do it. And I'll see you all in a little bit on something else to do. But, but don't find something else to do because this is really great. It really is. I'm, here's what I want to do. I have, a, I have a great idea in mind. I want to uh, show you this example. And then what I want to do is uh, just give me a, a, a moment here. And, uh, and then I want to uh, play the example so that you can hear it. And then I want you to go into, uh, throw you into uh, breakout rooms so that you can talk about how you would teach a student in order to uh, learn this stuff. And that's really the point of, of, uh, of tonight, to get you to start thinking about uh, about that. And, and so just give a, give me a, a, a moment here as I, uh, as I try to find my document that I was, uh, that I was frantically uh, looking for here. And uh, it is, it should be, oh, I was in the right spot before. I know it's the worst to have, watch someone dig through their computer. It really is, especially when uh, the person doesn't look like they know what they're doing. And so let me get this off the screen so that uh, I don't look like uh, as big of a fool as, uh, as you're all thinking that I am. Uh, but again, I do my best. I told you, I'm a bit clumsy, but I try. Not only that, I mean well. And so let's uh, just give me a moment as I try to walk and chew gum at the same time. And I'm getting closer. And uh, I'm almost ready to upload the document. I just have to find the thing. There it is. No, it isn't. There it is. Great. Okay, cool. So you see that I've just uploaded this. Now, you're going to have to log into Canvas, everybody, and <clears throat> jump over to our, uh, our, our class and do our, our module for, uh, uh, for this, uh, this evening. And um, what I want you to do is this. When you go into your groups, I'm interested in having you look at this example that I have uh, that I've uploaded, which is the LPAC listening and speaking example. And then I want you to, uh, to talk about it. Because the important thing, my friends, is this, that you begin to think about instruction, that you begin to think about the level, student levels, and let's imagine that you have somebody who is uh, in that intermediate stage that, uh, that they talk about. They're not in emerging, but they're in bridging. So about a level three. How are you going to help a level three student do two things? Summarize the presentation by help, by stating the main points. That's one thing that they have to do. And supporting details with the help of the visuals in both writing and speaking. You have to think about the kind of activities you're gonna have students do. So that's the task. And here is, I have to stop to share really quick uh, and restart it uh, so that you can hear it. I haven't um, played this uh, just yet, so hopefully it will actually play. Ready, set, zen. There we go. So the student listened to this selection. An important idea in both texts is that people struggled for the basics like food and housing. One example in the infographic is that nearly 25% of Americans were in poverty. Many had to wait in bread lines just to have enough to eat. Another example is the picture of the woman and two children who live in the shanty town. Additionally, they are barefoot and their clothes are dirty and tattered. In conclusion, both texts show how people were affected by the Great Depression. Okay, so think of an English learner now who has to process all that information, and now the student has to speak into the computer, you know? 
And this is what one student, this is an example of a student who did just that. Oh, for crying out loud. I think you said that people lost their jobs, like they're struggling to get like money to live in like clear houses like we do. And the, I think uh, they get their foods like from people that want to serve them, like they're helping, they're giving charity or something. And um, they, they, li they live in torn down houses. And like this one, the, her family is not, is like, they're not like healthy. They don't look healthy. And I think their mother lost her job, like. She lost it. That's all I know. My friends, if we look at this, and it says, summarize the presentation by stating the main points and supporting details with the help of the visuals, I don't think that's going to score very high. Because this question is asking the student to use language like, in slide two, we see a family, a family that is living in a shanty town. Their clothes are dirty and tattered. They have no shoes. This is an example of blah, blah, blah. And then the student has to relate that to all of this. You have to think about how you're going to structure experiences for students and how they're going to be able to do this in an effective way. So what I have done, my friends, is this. I have just posted in module six, the LPAC listening and speaking example, and it looks, let me move this over. I have posted the LPAC listening and speaking example right here. I'd like you to download it and open it up. And what you're going to see is this. And I would like to give all of you, I'm gonna throw you into some breakout groups. And I'm going to give all of you five minutes. And that my friend is called preview review. And that is a method that is used in instruction. Absolutely viable, 100% good. And you preview the instructions in the first language if you can do it, and then you review them. Uh, you, then you have them engage in English, and then you review the, the, uh, the lesson in, in Spanish or the other language. Having capable uh, community members, too, is essential. So if you've got uh, a group of uh, students who are, are, are new and they speak uh, a language that, you know, is, is, is hard to find, let's say Urdu, you know, but you go to the community and you try to find somebody who can participate in the class maybe. Or... There seems to be a problem. Excuse me a moment. Close the door, problem solved. But I think that's absolutely true. And working on vocabulary is clear. How about groups uh, five through, I guess, seven? What were your thoughts on, on this? Anyone from, uh, from that group or those groups? Oh, come on, come on, you can do it. I know we're approaching six o'clock. I'm gonna just uh, keep going because uh, I want to do. I want to record the next uh, presentation. You don't have to stay for it. You know we ended six, uh, but uh, I want to make sure I get all the information out there that uh, that you need. Um, and I want to go over the assignment. Okay. Well, it looks like uh, we've run out of gas on on this part, and that's fine. But let me just give you a few ideas about what I would do. The first thing that I would do is I would turn to the ELD standards. for that student's level, just for ideas about what it is that I should include. And I know that the student will need to be able to respond to like WH questions through self-questioning, for example, uh, and yes, no questions. And, and, and so I would just look at that. That's kind of, that is where I would begin. Because again, this is a test for the LPAC. 
So I need to look at the standards for a level three. Uh, now, I'm not gonna plan out a whole lesson here. All I'm gonna do is just throw out, the, throw out the ideas that I have about what I would do and how I would proceed. After I do that, the second thing that I would do is I would look at the question and see exactly what it says. And one thing to do is that they, the student has to identify the main uh, I, points and supporting details. And I would have to ask myself, how am I going to get that student to do that? Because the third thing that they have to do is this, they have to summarize. There's an added complexity to this. And that is that there is also audio and visual that go together. So the student has to be able to listen to the audio and interpret the video. Now, <clears throat> I believe that students are given uh, scratch paper or they, they, there's a notepad on the computer where they can type things. And clearly, one of the things that I would be working on when listening to this is how to do some kind of an outline for what I'm hearing, because there is a correspondence between what they're hearing and what they're seeing, and they have to put it together in order to be able to do this, which then leads to that. I love to draw, even though my, my drawings are terrible, you can see, but I don't have an example around here, but you should see you know, this is me planning my classes, for example. You know, I don't know if you can see that, but I write, I draw, I do all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and, and, and it just helps me uh, because I would, this is really where I would start, I, exactly with what you're seeing uh, right here. Now, let me give you another uh, clue uh, for what I would do. I would certainly do all the stuff that you were talking about right here. I didn't see anything on here that I thought was, you know, out of whack or anything else. This these things are really great ideas. What I'm trying to show you, and this again is for metacognition. That is what I'm trying to develop with you right now is met through metacognition. How me, somebody who's got 25 years of experience, what I would do, and, and, it, and, and it's not perfect, by the way. Uh, these are things that I would discuss with other teachers. But anyway, okay, let me get back to this. The last thing that, well, not the last thing that I would do is this. The student has to be able to deliver uh, spoken presentations. And, and, and so thinking about how to do that uh, with students, it's like <clears throat> for some students, especially students who are just getting out of the silent period or in the emerging period, you know, working in pairs that's why that think pair share thing is so useful. Working in pairs with a peer who is, uh, is, is not going to judge, not going to make fun of them, and, and creating an environment where accents are, are not only allowed but valued. And, 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 uh, and creating an environment where nobody is subject to any kind of uh, uh, you know, humiliation or, or anything else. And, and I know that it's, it's, it's often difficult uh, to do, but I'll, I'll tell you that what I've noticed in my 25 years is when you have classes that are structured for highly competitive environments, like sitting in rows, pass your papers back and you get a 25 or you gotta give up and give speeches and you have never done that before and then you get up there and you sweat and you're, you're uh, I don't know what your experience was like. If it was, if it was natural or whatever, that's great because that's what we're aiming for. If you are good at this, you are what we're aiming for then. And so you yourself have to think about how you got there and how you're going to get someone else. But I, let me get back to the classroom. Highly competitive classrooms are the ones that tend to breed that peck order and pecking at other students and picking on other students. It, it, it's just a breeding ground for that. So again, that's why I'm, I'm trying to take us away from that and, and give us a different way to proceed and invite you to do this. But anyway, pairs and then small group and, and maybe the first place you're gonna begin 
is with the teacher. Maybe it's just one-on-one -on -one with the teacher and then in a pair and then in a small group and then finally whole group and then finally practicing with a recorder. All students are gonna need this, but particularly ELD students. So let me, let me uh, try to uh, fly through a lot of these things. The, every one of these things from summarizing main points or identifying them to summarizing them to listening to the audio, audio and interpreting the visuals, that is going to require a lot of scaffolds. And the kinds of scaffolds that I'll put up here, I would put a, up here like a sentence frame, paragraph frame, closed notes, and then Cornell notes. Now, another thing that I have to have to say is that uh, the students are going to have to have, I'll put that down here, they have to have background knowledge. And, and I want to tell you uh, this, that for background knowledge, there is no reason why you couldn't put in small groups and give students the, the, you can't see this on my screen, you just have to remember, you know, like the, uh, the visuals from the chart of the stock market, the crash, uh, that, that, that section, put them in groups and just have them write out the details together, like brainstorming, doing this, and using scaffolds to complete it, to do, do that with parallel questions later on, having them create their own. Uh, having them connect to their own lives, certainly. Developing a vocabulary. And, and developing a vocabulary by taking their language from where it's at and building it up. Like when I told you, few of you have probably said the word countenance lately. This is an example I've already used. It just means, as I said, face. There's no reason why we can't take the language where it is and elevate it rather than using just memorization. Now, I don't think memorization is bad, by the way. It has its place. You know, using flashcards or using uh, these visuals, for example, and doing quick writes with them, all these things are great. But don't dominate the classroom with memorization. That's what, what I'm saying. So let me get to, to, to tell you about this, and I want to show you what the, what the assignment is so that, uh, that you know. And I hope that you're the friends who have, uh, have left will watch the end of this presentation so they know, uh, know what to do. Um, just give me, a, give me a moment. I got a chat up here. And yeah, there is an assignment uh, 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 this week. And I'll show you what it is in a second. So what I'm talking about when I say things, I'm just going to use these two things. Close notes. And then Cornell. Now, some of you might have experienced these things differently, so let me just give you the ones that I am familiar with. Just think of that audio, for example. Start with that thing. You know, an English learner is going to have difficulty hearing all of the words in there. So I would be doing the following. I would be taking the phrases like this one here, in the picture of the family, comma, we see blank and blank, whatever it was, and blank, whatever it was that, that is in the audio, I would be using a scaffold and they have to fill in what it is. And then after they have filled it in, the next thing they have to do is use their own words. That way they are <clears throat> hearing the language, picking up the most important elements, because again, remember, it's the main points. The main points of what? The audio and visual. At the same time, I would be doing 
work with the visuals and I would be using brainstorming. But again, I would return to a scaffold. So this here, the closed notes, C-L-O-Z-E, that is fill in the blank. That's all that means is fill in the blank, but we say closed notes. I would be using visuals with a brainstorm and then a paragraph frame. And what they have to do with the paragraph frame is just like the closed notes in the uh, stock market, whatever. They have to do like a fill in the blank. And then again, own words. Because they have to develop their own voice. The last thing that I would have them do is I would have them combine audio and video ideas and summarize. Now how you get there is up to you. You can use a traditional outline. Uh, you could do more clothes or you could just do on your own. When you think through these things, it's a matter of just trying to figure out how you're going to get the student to be able to hear and understand the language for the main points in both the audio and the visual. And the other thing that you have to do throughout this whole experience is you're going to have to use a lot of pair work for talking, maybe in the L1, uh, and then small group, and then coming back to whole group for discussion. But then this here has to be practiced, has to be practiced using a recorder. The student's going to have to use a recorder. Now remember, on these assessments, I believe the students can take notes. It's a good thing. Because when they're able to take notes on their own, it's a strategy that they can use to do this. I mean, I couldn't keep all that information in my head. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm pretty good. But I would be taking notes. And I would like to have a formal way of taking notes. Now, I don't believe that you can provide the students with any clothes or, or paragraph frames or what have you. They have to practice these things. And I'll tell you, this makes a class a heck of a lot more fun because I'll tell you what you do. You save all of this stuff and you build like a little portfolio for them, either online or in writing or taking pictures of it or whatever, because that way the student will see progress over time. That's what students love to see. They love to see themselves making progress from where they started to where they ultimately ended up. Let me go to Cornell notes and then I, I want to uh, uh, give you the assignment. So Cornell notes, are ones where you have essentially all of the places to brainstorm, to BS over here, and then you have a more formal writing here. And if students can learn stock phrases, like first we see, second there is, finally, if they can just learn to write formulaically in the beginning, it goes a long way because that way they can develop their own kind of clothes that they fill in uh, with, with uh, form, euleic writing. All of you did this when you learned uh, uh, the academic form, you know, the five paragraph essay, right? You know, maybe that's what I'll put in here, five paragraph or whatever. And it has to do the following, you know, it's got to find, they have to find the main points. And I'll show you this in a second. Or you have them do something like this, just a simple outline and speak. Because I don't know how much time they have. So you'll have to, you know, maybe just have them outline it and, and, and do it in a rapid fashion. But this is what you do. On one side here, you do your brainstorming. Your brainstorming of what? Of the audio main points and the visual main points 
And then what they have to do is combine these things into a summary. And they don't have to summarize everything. Teach students to be strategic. If they look at the stock market chart and they want to barf, then don't look at the stock market chart. Listen to the audio. It talks about a bread line. Listen to the audio. It talks about uh, you know, people not being able to get a job because the, uh, the uh, economy collapsed. The picture, the picture is an illustration of what families went through. Some had to live in shanty towns. And you see what that was like. No shoes, dirty clothes. You know, you get the idea. But all of the things that you see here are how I would plan this out using a lot of the things that you all talked about, using teaching that is going to involve a lot of scaffolding and support with closed notes, paragraph frames, a lot of paired work, small group work and discussion. And let me tell you, it's a blast to, to do this. I remember, uh, I don't want to give you any stories. I'll do that at story time another time. And then ultimately teaching them how they themselves can take control of their own learning. 